Alright friends, so now we're gonna talk about something called nested for loop. A nested for loop, it is very simple, we have a loop inside another loop. So that means we have a big loop, we call it the outer loop, and for each run of this big loop, we're gonna run completely a smaller loop, and we call this one an inner loop. And once this small loop is completed, we go to the next iteration of the outer loop, and the same thing gonna happen, we gonna run again completely this small inner loop, and again, once the smaller one is completed, we run one more iteration for the bigger loop. And of course, we can keep nesting loops inside another loop, so we could have like very small loop inside the middle one. So this is exactly what we mean with the loop inside another loop. So now let's see how we're gonna build it. Now we have this classical for loop, nothing fancy, we are just iterating through a sequence. Now in order to make a nested loop, we define a new for loop but inside the first one. So for example for y in a sequence like 1, 2. And let's call the first one an x so it sounds better. And with that we are iterating through two loop variables, the x and the y. And we are printing both of them, the x and the y. Now about the chart, Python has like two loops, so they are connected like this, but we are not finished yet. Once we reach the end of the second loop, it will go back to the start of the first loop. And of course, once everything is completed, we will go to the end. So as you can see, the start and the end of the second for loop is actually completely connected to the first loop. And again, we call the whole block as the outer loop and the block of code that is inside it we call it an inner loop so the second loop okay so now once you execute it python has to go and create two iterators one for the outer loop and another one for the inner loop so now python start with the outer loop and ask for the next item and iterator gonna answer with one since we are getting a value we are not at the end that's why python now has to go and start the inner loop. So here Python gonna ask for the next item in the second iterator in the inner loop. And here as well we will get one. So since we are getting a value we are not at the end and now Python has to go and finally execute the block of code print. So now in the print the x is assigned to one, the y is assigned to one as well. That's why in the output you will see 1, 1. And now Python will go and start from the top of the inner loop. And it's gonna ask for the second item of the inner iterator. We will get 2. And since we are getting value, we are not done yet with the inner loop. So it's gonna go and print. So the x is equal to 1, but now y is equal to 2. That's why you will see in the output 1, 2. So now it's gonna go to the top of the inner loop and ask give me the next item. Now the inner iterator gonna answer with a stop because we are at the end. So with that, Python gonna go and exit the inner loop and go to the end. But of course, we are not at the end actually. We will go to the top of the first loop. So everything that we have done so far, that was only for the first item of the outer loop. Now Python gonna go and ask the outer iterator for the next item, it's gonna be 2. And guess what? 2 is not the last item of the outer loop, that's why it's gonna go and start again completely the inner loop. So the inner iterator gonna answer with 1 and you will have in the print now x is equal to 2 because the outer loop has the value 2 and the y is 1 so you will have 2 and 1 and then the next value 2 2 and the inner loop gonna be done then exit again the inner loop but you have to go again to the top of the first loop and the same thing happen you will go to the third value do the whole inner iteration and then go back to the top of the loop. So as you can see, this is the third time we are executing the inner loop. And now Python gonna ask for the outer loop, give me the next item, the iterator gonna say stop, I don't have anything left. And finally, you will exit the outer loop and go to the end. And now we are at the end of the outer loop and everything stops. So this is exactly how Python executes the nested loops. And by the way, my friends, if you are enjoying this type of free tutorials where I'm sketching the concepts behind the scenes and showing the codes, and you would like to see more like this, then support the channel by subscribing, liking, commenting. This really helps a lot. So now let's go back. Okay, so let's have a very simple example. We're gonna start with the outer loop for x in range. Let's generate like, for example, three numbers. This is our outer loop, our big loop. Now inside it, we can add another loop. So for y in range, 
and this time for the smaller one let's go with two iterations so two numbers this is our inner loop and now we're gonna go inside the inner loop and print so i'm gonna print for example between two parentheses we're gonna have the first variable the x and then separate it with a comma and then the second variable so something like this let's go and execute it now as you can see for each value from the outer loop we have two rows so zero 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 one then one zero one one and for the last one two zero two one so that's it as you can see very simple this is how you can nest two loops inside each other's and of course you can go and add a third loop like for example for z in range let's add as well two so now we have to be careful this print should be inside the third for loop and here we're gonna go and add our third variable the z so now let's go and execute it now as you can see we are getting like matrix of numbers so as you can see we have a loop inside the loop inside the loop this is really easy Okay, so now we come to the real talk. Why do we need those stuff? When we gonna use nested loops in our data projects? And for that, we have actually two major use cases. The first use case is for crossing and combining our data, or we call it pairing the data. So it's all about we have two different lists and I would like to see all possible combinations of those two lists. So that means I'm gonna go and combine and pair each value from one list with the other values of the other list. Okay, so now let's have an example where we have two completely different lists. The first one gonna be the colors. So we have red, we have blue and green. And another list, it is about the sizes. So we have stuff like maybe L, M and S. Now let's say that I would like to go and generate maybe a product catalog with all combinations of colors and sizes. So I want to pair each color with each size. Now, in order to do that, we can use the nested loops. And here it doesn't matter where you start. Like for example, let's start with the colors. So for color in colors. Next one gonna be about the size as an inner loop. So for size in sizes. Now, all what you have to do is to go and just print those two variables. So print where we're gonna have something maybe like this. Maybe the first variable gonna be the color. And then after that, I'm gonna say size and we have the variable here, size. So now let's go and execute it. As you can see for each color, I'm getting all the sizes. So for the red, the blue and the green. So this is what we call sometimes Cartesian or cross or combining the data where you pair all values with all values. So this is a nice use case for the nested loops. Okay, so now moving on to the second use case and the most important one, we use it in order to go through layers or we call it drilling into hierarchy. Let's have this sketch to understand this. Okay, the first example of that we have hierarchy in the dates. Like for example, we start with the years 2026 and 2027. Now for this, we could make a for loop in order to iterate through all the years. And this we consider as the first level. And now we could drill down into more details if we go to the months. So that means we add another loop inside the year for a month in months. So we are at the second level. Now we can go deeper where we go to the days. We are now at the lowest level, at the level three, where we add a third loop where we say four day in days. And after that, we have to go and do something about all those three informations. So as you can see, we are using nested for loop in order to go through different layers in order to drill down into hierarchy. Let's have an example. Now let's have an example. Let's say that I have to go and create multiple reports for each year, for each month, and as well for each day. And now instead of doing it manually, we can go and create for loops. So as usual, let's go and create our data. We're gonna start with the years. So let's say 2026 and 2027. And the next level is going to be the months, where let's say that we have only two, for example, January and February. And the last level, the days, I will go and generate it using the range. So it starts with one and ends with, yeah, 29. So now I have all my data and all what you have to do is now just to go and create the for loops. So the first one is going to be for the years, for Y in years, the next one for M in months, and the last one for the days for D and days. Now we have our nested loops, the three loops. And all what you have to do, for example, let's go and just print the file name. So it's going to be F 
and the naming convention start with report underscore and then the year so i'm gonna go and get the variable of the year then the month so the m and the last one gonna be the day d and as i said we are creating csv files so actually that's it let's go and try this out and execute so now in the output we're gonna get a huge list because we have here a lot of days so we are gonna have all those file names that combines the year month and days and of course we're gonna learn later how to create files but for now we are just printing it so look at this with just few lines of codes you can generate massive amount of data and as well you're gonna save a lot of manual work and this is exactly why we are learning about the loops and another example for this use case and this one is very common as you are working with data we navigate through tables and columns. So if you know some database concepts, you know that we store our data inside tables, columns and rows. So the table gonna be the highest in the hierarchy. And if you drill down to the next level, you go to the columns. So each table contains multiple columns. And now if you want to go deeper, you go to the rows, to the actual data. And in order to navigate through this hierarchy, we could use nested loops. So for the first level, we could have like four table in tables. Then we drill down to the second level for column in columns. And then to the last level where we say for row and rows. And at the end, as usual, we have to do something like maybe cleaning up the data, doing different preparations and manipulations to the data depends on what you are doing. And this setup you see now, those three different nested for loops, it's something that you're gonna do in each data project. So if I open now my project, I'm always gonna see those combinations where I'm iterating through the tables and then the columns and then the rows and then doing something. So now I'm gonna show you an example that I just used in my project last week and I was running an SQL query on multiple tables and columns just to check whether we have nulls in the tables. And now of course we will not talk about the SQL query itself. It's all about that I had a huge list of tables and columns and if I'm gonna go and write those queries manually it's gonna take really a lot of time. Now instead of that I just wrote a few line of codes in Python and it solved the task. So let me show you how I solved it. It is very simple. First we're gonna go and create a list of all tables that we are interested in. So let's say we have the customers, we have orders and products. So here we make a list of all tables that I would like to query. And here, for example, the prices. Then next, I need the columns that actually I am checking. So we're gonna make another list for the columns. And here, I was checking only for the IDs and the creation dates. So those two columns are actually part of all my tables. And then I made really nice two listed loops. So I said for T and tables for c and columns and now what we're gonna do we're gonna take the query over here and add for it the variables so i just made a print and then we start writing the query so select counts star from but now instead of saying customers i would like to get the variable from the list so instead of this one we're gonna have the dynamic table name it's gonna be the t and after that we have the static parts we have the where and then we have the column name and again i will not make it static i'm gonna go and get it actually from my list the last part is actually static so is null and then the semicolon so as you can see i have converted my query into a dynamic query now let's go and execute it as you can see in the output i have automated everything i got all my queries and for each table we have two queries one for the id and another one for the create date and with that i don't have to write anything anymore manually i could just make a few lines in python in order to automate the whole job and if i got in the future more tables and columns i'm just gonna go and extend it over here and then automatically generate my SQL query. And I know this sounds really simple, but this is what advanced data engineers actually do. Especially if they are building systems like Data Warehouse, Data Lake, Data Lake House, we will be dealing with a huge amount of tables and columns, and you cannot go and hard code everything. So you have to load the tables from A to B, you cannot go and script something for each table. Instead, we build something called metadata driven pipelines we do exactly what we have done in this example where we write the metadata 
table names, the columns, and as well the data types and so on in variables and key values. And then we make a script like this over here where we iterate through the metadata and we do something like maybe copying the tables, changing the schema, doing few preparations. And with that, you will be saving as a data engineer or maybe as a data analyst if you are doing something huge in many tables. You save, my friends, a lot of time and I use it many times in my projects. So I know we are talking about the nested for loops, but this is something very advanced and they're going to make your work highly automated. And another example about hierarchy in real data projects is that if you are working with data lakes, like for example, if you are storing data in Azure, you might have like some containers and inside each container, there will be different folders. And inside those folders, you're going to find different files. And of course, my friends, we use a nested for loops in order to navigate through this hierarchy so that we reach those files and then we load them maybe to somewhere else or we do some transformations. This is something that you're going to do a lot if you are analyzing those files or you are doing some data engineering about it. And of course, there are many other examples that you're going to encounter, but the rule is very simple if you have different layers, different levels, and you have like hierarchy, you will end up, my friend, using nested loop in order to navigate through the structure. So those are some real use cases about the nested loops. All right, friends, so with that, you have learned how to build a nested for loop. And with that, we have covered everything about the for loops in Python. Now we're going to speak about the next type of loops. We have the while loop. So if you like this video and you would like to have more free content like this, then support the channel by subscribing, liking, commenting. This really can help the channel to grow and to reach others like you. So thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video.